morning. We are, we're kind of running on a skeleton crew. We've had some last minute stuff happen. Uh, so very glad to see you guys here. Uh, glad you showed up. A uh, couple other announcements that we've got. So every third Thursday, uh, we are now hosting a community dinner. Uh, this is Diana Harvkey's, uh her group has, has put this together and, and we, we host it, but she wanted me to announce uh, so that way you guys can come and enjoy it. Uh, it's actually a really great ministry because it's meals that are going towards uh, for shut-ins um, and really anybody that needs it. Um, so, but that's there, and so you're you're welcome to come take a part of that. And then also on Mondays at six, we've got Arrowhead Recovery. Uh, continue to be in prayer for that uh, as as God's using that. We've averaged about eight, but we've had a lot of different people kind of rotating in and out. The total number, remember now, 20, 21, That's what I was thinking. So we've had twenty one individuals. Uh, come to Arrowhead Recovery, uh, so it's it's been it's been, it's doing great. It's a great start, and it's going to continue to flourish and grow. So I'm excited about that. Um, August 25th, we've got youth uh, back to school bash. Uh, so those of y'all with uh, youth in your life, tell them to show up on that day to uh, enjoy some uh, food, and there'll be prizes and whatnot and games. It's going to be a good time. Um, and then last August 29th, so. This is, this is a brand new thing, all right? Uh, we are actually joining with Bear Creek and uh, Rose Hill, uh, for sure, um, possibly Corinth. Um, for every fifth Sunday, the church is going to get together and just have a big sing-along. Uh, you know, there'll be some special music and just have a good time. There'll be a good fellowship and whatnot. Um, this this go-around is at Bear Creek. So on August 29th, and I don't have a time for that yet. I got to touch base and find out what time it is. But at some point that evening, we'll join. We'll we'll, we'll go over there, and it'll be a good, it'll be a good rip horn time. So um, so y'all be sure to kind of plan for doing that. Um, any other announcements I've forgotten? I don't think so. Sweet. All right, I'm gonna open up in prayer, and then uh, Carolyn's gonna lead us in music today. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for uh, just the the opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you for the opportunity to to serve in your name with these different ministries that are going on, and, and, um, and we just I would just ask that you continue to guide us as a church into what you would have for us. Uh, Lord, today we ask for you to uh, encourage us and, and bless us, but also uh, we ask that our worship is a blessing to you and that we, we come before you with um, just with, with, with honor for who you are. Lord, we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen.
Take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 508. Sing all the verses of Have Faith in God. No matter what's going on, that's kind of our lesson in, in our class today was remaining faithful no matter what's going on in the world around you. And this song's a great encouragement for that if you pay attention to the words. standing on the solid rock. Stand before the throne. On 
No, I'm not going to sing. Those of y'all that are, I thought I thought about it for half a second, but I was like, nah, don't need everybody running out the door when I'm trying to preach. So, no, uh, we are, are we are continuing in our, our series on the goal of faith uh, this morning. We're actually going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, so those of y'all that might have come from a more charismatic tradition, uh, yes, we do talk about the Holy Spirit in Baptist churches. It's just few and far between, it feels like, sometimes. Um, and those of y'all that grew up Southern Baptist like I did, by the way, there's a third person of the Trinity. His name is the Holy Spirit. Um, and y- y- yes, you'll hear about him today. So um, I'm, I'm only half joking. Uh, quite, quite honestly, I've, I've gone through churches, been there for years, never heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit, um, which is not a good thing, by the way. So anyway. But I'm always up in prayer again, uh, and then we're going to be looking. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit of a, a Bible drill day, so just be ready. Um, I've got we'll have verses on the screen though, um, if, if you need them. But let's pray. Father, again we thank you for the day. We thank you for your word and 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 the opportunity to read your word. And Lord, we thank you for your Son who came to die for us, um, who who died and and rose again, opening up the doors of heaven, but also opening up that your Holy Spirit can come to us. And so, Father, we receive him today. We we thank you for uh, the wisdom that he gives us, and we ask for that now as as we look at your word and what you have for us. Uh, Father, I do pray that these these aren't my words and my message, but that we walk away knowing that you have spoken and that you have told us what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we looked at uh, Jesus' proclamation of freedom in uh, Luke 4, and compare it to the lies of Satan who keeps us captive in sin. And, and I bring that up because I want to go back to Luke 4, uh, verse 18. So let's look at that real quick. Um, if, you, if you missed last week, uh, what you can do is highlight these verses and then kind of go back and look because the, the, the big thrust was that Christ sets us free from Satan, from the powers of Satan. And it's very, um, it's, it's very telling that the temptations of Jesus come right before Jesus makes his proclamation about what he's come to do. And so that's, that's why we looked at that. Uh, but let's read uh, 4, 18, 19 again. Um, if I can find it in my Bible, get to the right page. Here we go. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I read this again because, like I said, and a lot of times in Southern Baptist churches, we focus a lot on Jesus, and rightly so. However, we tend to forget that the Holy Spirit was actively involved with everything that Christ did. And that's why here we read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That Christ did what he could because he was God incarnate, but also because God, the Holy Spirit, was working with him together. Um, one of the things that, uh, as you read through the whole Bible, uh, which you, you should do that multiple times, uh, but what you'll find is that it's never just God the Father doing something, or just the Son doing something, or just the Holy Spirit doing something, but they work together, right? It's, it's the three in one, it's the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, they work together to fulfill God, what God wants to do. Um, and so here, We see that working out. Christ came to provide liberty. Well, how does he do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. That the the man, Jesus, right, he's fully man, he's fully God together, but the man, his his human aspect limited what all he could do because he was human. I think sometimes we tend to forget that, Uh, and sometimes people lean too far and say, well, it was just a human. Well, no, he wasn't just human. He He was God incarnate. But he also wasn't just God. He wasn't just a, some spirit floating around making himself look like human. No, he was, he was human too. And so the Holy Spirit is working to re- re- bring liberty. All right, so Christ comes to set us free, uh, far more than any civic freedom. And, and like 1 John 3, it says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. But Christ does not free us 
only to say, okay, well, go, go about your way. One day I'll show up and I'll, I'll pick you up. We're, we're not free to just run about and, and basically make our lives miserable again, right? No, in, it is Christ who frees the image of God in us, and it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live in God's image. So when we think about the, the big series and, and the, the big story of Scripture that we've been looking at, we have God creates the world, and, and by the way, in Genesis uh, 1, 2, right there it says the Spirit was above the waters. The Holy Spirit is there active in creation. So he, he creates us, he makes a great world, everything's great, everything's good, and then we mess it up, right, and we're, we're corrupted, that image of God in us is corrupted, and so we're not living as we should because sin has tarnished us. Well, Christ sets us free from like what we talked about last week, and then the Holy Spirit comes in, and says, okay, now let me, let me point you in the way you should go. Let me enable you to do the things that you should do. And so God who creates us is the same God who saves us. is also God who sustains us and carries us and points us in the way that we should go. And in John 3, just kind of as an extra, we, it's God who recreates our hearts and lives with us and dwells in us to live out. And that's, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He is God with us. Um, He's also a uh, he, uh, just throwing that out there. Every once in a while you'll hear somebody call the Holy Spirit an it. Um, it's not an it, it's not the force. I love Star Wars, but the- theology from Star Wars is not good. So that's, don't watch Star Wars and think that's good theology. That's bad theology, it's horrible, right? No, the Holy Spirit is a he. He is a person who walks with us and works with us and is in us. Um, now, just as, again, with Bible trivia for you, um, Jesus is actually quoting from Isaiah there. Um, but we're not going to look at the verse that he's quoting because what's really interesting in Isaiah 11:2, uh, you can turn back to, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, talking about the Messiah, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So in Isaiah, we have uh, uh, like three descriptions of who the Holy Spirit is. And, and look at these categories, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And we talk about it all the time, Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. The spirit of counsel and might, these are very much military terms. That it is the Holy Spirit who helps us claim victory. Christ brings the victory. Christ breaks the powers of darkness. And for us to partake in that, we need the Holy Spirit to help us with that. And that's what he does. And then the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things, like it says in John. So we're going to look at that today, and we're going to look at it really quickly. Um, for those of y'all that were not in Bible drill as kids like I was, and, and flipping through this Bible is, is like second nature because you had uh, little old ladies and, and grown men say things like, quicker, quicker, faster, faster, why are you so slow, what are you doing? Right, so we're not going to do that, I'm not going to do that to you today, um, but it is on the screen so you can kind of keep up with what we're doing. All right, so let's look at the first one, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. So the first aspect of the Spirit, he gives us wisdom and understanding. And this is, this is one that we typically think of. When we th- think about who the Holy Spirit is, this is what we think of. So it is through the Holy Spirit that we can begin to understand the higher wisdom of God. And I did put there on purpose, we can begin to understand. It's, it's not like a light switch is flipped and we just, we know everything. Uh, it's, no, we, 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 it's an ongoing, growing process. But we, we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we can begin that process. Uh, I, I'm firmly convinced that there are church people that are not Christians. They just sit in a pew a lot. And the reason they never understand the things of God and they continue to struggle with living the Christian life is because they've never received the Holy Spirit. They've never been born again. They've never surrendered to Christ. They've never asked for forgiveness. They've never asked for eternal life. They've never gone through that process. They've just simply uh, you know, prayed a prayer, got dunked, got sprinkled or something. They've gone through the motions, the rituals, of religion, but they've never actually experienced the Holy Spirit, and this is uh, this is this is the defining characteristic. And the thing is, there's nothing that I can do to make you experience the Holy Spirit. Um, I can tell you all about Him. I can tell you everything that He's going, He wants to do with you, but until you actually surrender, and that's not just like reading a, a rote prayer. Or um, like I don't. This isn't a magic dunking tank. It's it's not like when we fill it up. Um, I do some kind of weird voodoo thing, and then when you go in there, you come out just like oh, like that's it's just water. I mean, just spoiler alert. It's just water back there. So, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you fully surrender to Christ, 
you actually are regenerated, reborn, and that begins the process of understanding. And, and I have no idea how many times I've, I've talked to people who've grown up in church, but at some point in their adult life, they realize they've never actually surrendered to Christ. They've never actually become a Christian. And when they do that, it, it's like a whole new world. Um, because it is. It, I mean, it's, it's a whole new understanding and illumination. So the Holy Spirit, though, it's through him that we can begin to understand the higher wisdom of God. Uh, James 1.5, I, I, I put it in here because it's, it's one of those I think everybody should memorize, and so I'm going to tell it to you until you have it memorized. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you're here today and you think to yourself, well, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get these things. I, I, I know the preachers are using English, but I don't understand the words coming out of his mouth. That James reminds us you can have wisdom. It is available to you. And, and for those of y'all that, um, unfortunately, your teachers labeled you as the dumb kid in school, and you've gone through your whole life thinking you're the dumb kid, God doesn't think you're dumb. He has given you a brain to use, and if you will ask him, he will give you wisdom to understand. Um, it is some of the wisest people I've known have zero education, and, and I've met PhDs that were kind of stupid, so there you go. Um, oh, yeah, I'm getting recorded. Anyway. Uh, so, but when we ask for wisdom, uh, it's just like Solomon records in Proverbs. We talked about this in Proverbs 8. I, I, I'm reinforcing these old things because I'm hoping what y'all have seen, if you stayed with us through the series, that all these things are intertwined. And, and what's, what's happening today is, is I'm going to start kind of pulling them together. And then the next two weeks, we're going to get super practical. Um, it will probably be the most practical sermons I'll ever preach in my life. Because what I want us to see is that all of this theology and all these things that we've talked about at a very academic level, it has very practical implications for our life. And, and this is where that transition happens because the Holy Spirit takes all that theology, all that deep understanding, all that high and lofty spirituality that a lot of us just struggle with, and the Holy Spirit says, you don't actually have to understand all of that, I just need you to do this today. And then as we do this today, he guides us step by step. And then eventually we, we start to understand more and more and we get it. But that's, that's where we're go at today. So Proverbs 8, Jesus said, or excuse me, not in Proverbs 8, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And then, so that's what Jesus says. And, and we, we say he is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. But the connection here is in Proverbs 8 with this wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. Because in Proverbs 8, we see uh, that wisdom declares she walks in the way of righteousness, right? That's an 820. That, by the way, it, just write notes. Like, y'all can ask me later, text me later, but just, I've, I've got it in your bulletin. It'll be on the screen, but just kind of, just, just, just pay attention. You'll get it. All right, but in Proverbs 8, uh, 20, wisdom says that she declares the way of righteousness, right? And then in 8, 7 and 8, wisdom says she speaks only truth, right? Giving knowledge to those who ask of her. And then in 8, 35, 36, wisdom gives life to those who hearken to her voice. So Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and life, right? If you want to, if you want to get to heaven, if you want to know the Father, you go through him. And in the Old Testament, wisdom says, I'm going to point you in the way, I'm going to point you to life, and, and I'm going to point you to truth, right? Y'all see how those work together? And, and this, is, this is why there were some connections. Earlier we talked about Christ being wisdom, but he's not. Just throw that out there. Uh, but this is, this is what God's doing. He's, he's, he's guiding us through Old and New Testament. He's guiding us to an understanding that we were created to know him. We were created to be related to him. We were created to, to worship him, to, to, to walk in the path that he's given us. Like to, to get, He gives us the desires of our hearts. We, we were created to do things in this world that are great and wonderful and enjoyment and, and their enjoyment for others, their enjoyment for us, their enjoyment for him. And all that works if we understand what he's done. But what sin has done is broken that understanding. It's, it's, it's that lie that we talked about last week. That Satan says, well, no, if you really want to be happy, you need a lot of stuff. And God says, well, no, that's, that's not right. Because stuff corrupts, stuff gets destroyed, stuff will enslave you. Right, Satan says, if you really, if you really want to be free and have, power, you got to have power. You got to be over people. There has to be people that that are under you, because only people that are in charge are actually free to do what they want. 
And God says, well, that's complete foolishness because, because he's in charge. No, there's, there's not a king in this world that is actually in charge. God is sovereign. And it's not for our freedom is not contingent on other people being enslaved. Our freedom comes from the fact that we serve God Almighty who is in charge and that he will give us the desires and the purpose of our heart when we follow him. All right, this is, this is how it all works together. I'm hoping you guys are starting to see that. So then uh, back to John 14, right? Jesus says in uh, verse 15 to 17, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And that should be capital S, hopefully in your Bible. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be where? In you, right? So the Holy Spirit is going to be with you and not just with you, but he will be in you. So when we become a Christian and we get that new heart, we also receive the Holy Spirit, and he's with us, he's in us, and he's going to share with us the truth. And the world can't receive it, right? Because it neither sees him nor knows him. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, you're never going to know the things of God. You'll know a lot about him, but you'll never actually know him. And that's the difference there. Um, and, there, and there's a reason why Jesus starts that with you. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because a lot of us get stuck on that first verse and we think, well, if I do all the right things, then God will be pleased with me and then maybe I get to go to heaven. And that is called paganism. That's, that's what the old religious systems were, was you do a lot of stuff and then you hope maybe the gods will be happy with you. That's not how Christianity works. That's why we call it good news. The good news is God loves you despite your rebellion. God loves us despite the fact that we're evil, rotten sinners doomed for hell. And he sent his son to die for us and to resurrect so that we can have heaven available to us. And the proof of that is the Holy Spirit comes to us and reforms us and remakes us. And so if we love him, we'll keep his commandments, not because we're, we're bound to, not because we're obligated to, not because we're trying to earn love, but because those that love God, those that love Christ, those that have understand that they are forgiven in Christ, they want to obey those commandments. Because the more we understand about what God is doing in our hearts and our minds, the more we realize that, no, I want to obey God because he's got my best interest at heart. He's not making arbitrary rules to, uh, to, to ruin my fun. He's actually building fences so I don't go kill myself. Right? I mean, it's, it's just, it, there's a reason why there's safety rails on tall buildings. There's a reason why you only walk so far to the Grand Canyon. Right? There's a reason why God says, this is sin, don't go any further. Because going further will bring death. So if you love him, you will keep his commandments. Not because you're obligated to, because you'll want to. And this is what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts, is that the more we understand God's love, the more we want to obey what he's doing. So the Holy Spirit brings us understanding. Uh, and so uh, the point you're bulletin there, the Father creates us, the Son restores us, and the Holy Spirit empowers us. And it's, and it's all for peace. That last, uh, I, didn't, I didn't read these verses, 25 to 27. It says, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. A lot of times we read these and, and, and we want it to kind of help placate our, our daily lives. We just think about the trials and tribulations and we're like, no, Jesus leaves us peace. We want peace. That's good. And that's rightly so, but, but keep in mind, the Holy Spirit's goal is to bring peace in our lives. And so that's, that's why it, it, uh, the, the Holy Spirit kind of spurs us towards good works and towards righteousness and towards following those commandments. It's because that's what's going to bring us peace in our lives. When, we, when we've removed sin from our hearts and our minds, we find ourselves with more and more peace. And that is a far greater treasure than a new bass boat or something else. That's my Louisiana raising coming out. Y'all are like, bass boats, what? Anyway, but all scripture points us to the realization that God's love is poured out on us. Uh, we've done nothing but rebel against God, but, he's, but he still desires to save us, still desires to sustain us, and let us know him. And it's that knowledge of God that's going to bring us ultimate peace. So then the next category, the spirit of counsel and might. So the Holy Spirit's called this, and like I said, these are very much military terms. The, the, it's like a war council. Um, it is the spirit of might. He is bringing us victory. The Holy Spirit helps us walk in victory. 
Christ did the work on the cross and coming out of the grave. But for us to partake in that, we need the Holy Spirit to help empower us and to recreate us and regenerate us to live out in that. So we see this truth throughout again. Um, but I want to do uh, kind of a random one for you. Ready? In Judges, right? Judges actually has the Holy Spirit in it, believe it or not. So, uh, but in Judges, you have Othniel, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson. They, they're specifically named as the Spirit of the Lord working in them to accomplish what they need to do, which is, which is bring victory for Israel. Um, so first one that's named is Othniel, uh, Judges 3, 7 through 11. He's raised up to be a deliverer. Uh, in verse 10 we read, The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. So how is it that Othniel was able to conquer Israel's enemies? Well, the Spirit of the Lord raised him up and, and, and gave him that victory. Judges 3, uh, let's see, Gideon breaks the altar of Baal and tells the Midianites to let Baal contend for himself if he is a god, which is one of those funny lines in Scripture. He's just, i got to give you this story because it's funny. So Gideon is raised up. He's, he, god tells him, you're going to go uh, defeat the Midianites. And after a long conversation about Gideon talking about how short he is and, and how bad his tribe is, um, God says, no, go do it. So he goes into the temple of Baal, and he destroys the statue, right? It's a, it's a big, you know, it's a fairly big statue. Pulls it down, the whole nine yards, uh, just ransacks the place, and he leaves. Now, obviously the Midianites are mad at him, and so they come talking to him. And Gideon's response to this is, well, if he's a god, why don't he take care of himself? I think that's funny. I don't, I mean mainly because of the snarkiness of it. It seems like something I would do. It's like, well, if he really is God, maybe he should be able to take care of himself. Why are y'all here? So anyway, but moving on. So, but in Judges 6, 34 and 35, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abyssalites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went to see them. So the Spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon, which is kind of a weird verb, but I ain't got time to go into that. Uh, but basically what he's saying is the Holy Spirit covers him, and whenever the Spirit uh, you know, prompts Gideon, what he does is he sends out messengers. He sends out messengers to go tell all these tribes that, hey, come join us because we're, we're about to do some battle. It's going to be fun. Um, and then the story unfolds with some very uh, unorthodox tactics, war tactics. That's a good story. Y'all should go read that. I don't have time today. Uh, but he empowers Gideon to lead the army. They do defeat Midian. Um, in Judges eleven twenty nine, Jephthah passes through hostile territory to destroy the Ammonites uh, because it says the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Um, and then last, of course, the famous Samson. Several times throughout Samson's story, it says the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, uh, which is, again, another interesting verb. But Judges fifteen fourteen it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. Some of y'all were lied to in Sunday school or VBS, because uh, I was lied to in Sunday school or VBS, and you were told the foolish thing that because Samson had long hair, God gave him strength. His hair had nothing to do with that. That was just a physical, that was a complete physical symbol, um, and a, a, it was an act of faith, but that's not what gave him his strength. God gave Samson, Samson the strength to, to break those bonds and to, to kill thousands of Philistines with uh, donkey's jawbone and one of the great Hebrew poetry is in that verse too, but you ruin it, it's ruined in English. Um, I mean, it's just, it's the Spirit of the Lord is what empowers Samson to do what he's doing. So, um, again, that's something for other days. But anyway, so these Old Testament stories, though, they foreshadow what occurs in the life of Christ. Israel's judges and kings, they could only give a partial victory. So when you look at judges, you'll notice that there's a cycle that the Spirit of the Lord comes, they get victory, but then the Israelites go back into sin, and so then they got to get victory again, then they go back into sin. It's a cycle going on, going. And then eventually they get a king because they figure if they get a king, they can do right. And uh, Samuel says, you don't need a king, you have a king. If you'd pay attention to the king you have, you wouldn't have these problems. And they're like, no, we want a king. And so then they get kings, and then that perpetuates the cycle. Uh, so what they all fail to do in Old Testament Israel times, Christ comes and he, and he fulfills uh, that actual victory. So then in Romans 8... Right, uh, Paul's talking about that victory in Christ, and Paul's talking about what it is that the Holy Spirit's going to do with this. And in Romans 8, 1 through 2, we read, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life 
has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Right? This is that, that big point that he's making. And then the rest of Romans 8 actually dissects what, what, what he just says. But he's saying there's now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And this is one of those verses you should highlight, meditate on. Um, if you are anyone who has any kind of past that you think good church people will look down upon, uh, one, just know that those good church people got their own past and they got their own problems. But two, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. If God has saved you, you are saved. If God has forgiven you, you are forgiven. Done. End. End of story. No more. There's no caveat to that. Because of Christ, we receive forgiveness and we're forgiven. The end of the matter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. This was, this was a great lie of the Catholic Church. Yes, Jesus saves, but you've got to work really hard to make your Pope happy. No, no, there's no condemnation. If Christ has set you free, you are free. If God has forgiven you, you are forgiven. The problem is some of us just don't receive that forgiveness, and we live like we're still condemned. You're not condemned. If, if you have surrendered to Christ, if you've received the Holy Spirit, if when you pray, you know God hears you, and you know that God loves you, and you know that God has good things in, for, in store for you, you're done with the past guilt and the past shame. So just move on from it, right? There, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. The Holy Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus. So the law of sin and death, those old ways that want to burden us down and bring back guilt and, and make us go back into habits that we know we shouldn't do, you're, you're done with that. We're moving on because Christ has set you free and the Holy Spirit is in you. So we are forgiven because of Christ and we can know we are forgiven because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, all right? <clears throat> so our victory is over death itself, and, and how can we know that we'll defeat death? We'll look, we'll look at Romans 8, 11, right? Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the, the ultimate adversary for any human being is death. And that death is brought on because of sin. But because Christ has conquered sin, because the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, then we can rest assured that we will be raised too. This is why we say that the resurrection of Jesus is the absolute foundation of all Christianity. Without the resurrection, nothing else matters. We are all just wasting our time. But because Jesus is alive, we will know that we'll live too. Because he lives, I'll live. And just like Job says, even if my body decays in the ground, yet shall I live because Christ is risen. And how does this work? Because the Holy Spirit gives life. So it's like I've said before, if we, if we know that God has created us, and we know that God has given us a purpose, and we know that that purpose is our salvation, it's in heaven, and we know that, that Christ is risen and will live too, then we can know that God is working in our present too. If he took care of yesterday, and I know he's taking care of tomorrow, I can know that he's taking care of today. And he does that through the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? How do we hear that? We listen to the Holy Spirit who's with us and dwells in us. Our victory is assured. Christ is risen. We'll rise too. Now, hold, if you've turned to Romans 8, hold your place there because we're going to come back. But I want to look uh, once more at John's gospel as we look at the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, this last description, like I said, it's kind of typically how we think of the Holy Spirit. Um, John 16, 7 through 15 is one of the most famous descriptions. Um, and, and in that, though, we're just going to read 13 and 14 because this is, this is key for us today. So John 16, four, uh, I think I have a typo. I've got a typo in one place. So somewhere around John 13 to 15 is where we're going to be. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's going to come. He's going to guide us into all truth. Um, but that truth is the fact that Jesus is risen. He's going to glorify Christ. One of the things that the test that John talks about in First John is how do you discern between spirits? How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit talking or something else? If the Holy, when, whenever that voice says Jesus is risen, that that is the truth. When you hear that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, if it if it falls under that, that's the Holy Spirit. If it's anything else, just ignore it because that's that's called the devil. So. Uh, but the Holy Spirit guides us to all truth, glorifying Christ. All right, Romans 8 then, 
uh, describes the work of the Holy Spirit in that he gives life, he gives victory, he gives knowledge. All this points us to the fear of the Lord. So going back to Romans 8, we're going to read 12 through 17. And I'm going to give you a chance to turn to it because I want to make sure you get these. So Romans 8, 12 through 17. Paul writes, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, Paul says a lot in that passage, so let's kind of break it down real quick. So, first off, we're, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We, we have a debt to pay, but that debt is to Christ, right? If, if Christ has forgiven our sin, then we are now indebted to Christ for our very lives. And, and that's, that's just the truth of Christianity. I, I did not work towards my salvation. There's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. Christ did everything. So I'm indebted to him, right? But we're indebted not to live according to the flesh, right? Because if you live according to the flesh, right? If you live in that sin nature, then what happens? What happens when you sin a lot? You, yeah, you're dead. You go to hell. That's why Christ came, so that we didn't have to, that we didn't have to die and we have to go to hell, right? But if by the Spirit, right, capital S again, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if... If by surrendering to the Holy Spirit, I put to death my old self, right, and I, and I, and I say, that's done, I'm, I'm no longer that way, I'm, I now live in the Holy Spirit, I now live for what God has designed, then I will live, and I will truly live. So this is, this is what Paul's talking about here, right? And then he says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. I, I lament the number of Christians these days, especially in the last couple of years, that have fallen back into this spirit of fear. There is no reason to be afraid. Whether, whether because of new governments, whether because of new diseases, whether because of new theories, whether because the school's doing this or that, because my job site's doing this or that, because my boss is a jerk, because blah, 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 because the crops didn't come in. Whatever the millions of things in this world to make us afraid and, and to fear death, don't. Because Christ is risen, Christ gives us victory, and we don't have a spirit of fear. We have the Holy Spirit. The sovereign God of creation dwells in you. I mean, let that sink in for a little bit, right? The, the king of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, dwells in you. He is with you and in you. Why in the world would I be afraid? If, if God Almighty is there with me, whom shall I fear? That's what Paul says later in chapter 8. If God is with us, who, who could possibly be against us? So there's no reason to fear. So we don't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back in fear. We receive the spirit of adoption as sons or daughters. You know, that's a general word there. But we cry, Abba, Father. And, and you, you probably heard Abba is very much a, uh, a, a term of intimacy. It is, it's, it's like when, you're, when your kid said, Dada. Right, that's that's what Abba means. Um, but Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How can we know that we're saved? The Holy Spirit's going to let us know. And and if anybody here is is questioning your salvation, that's that's the question you got to ask yourself: Is the Holy Spirit in me? Does the Holy Spirit bear witness that I am saved, or or am I just a mouse spinning on a little wheel hoping that I'm going to get to heaven? When we live according to the Spirit, He will put to death the deeds of the body. We are heirs with Christ, and yes, we will suffer like Him. We, we tend to forget the King of Kings did suffer while He was on this earth, but just as He was glorified and exalted, we will also be glorified and exalted. That's, uh, that's the end of our Sunday school lesson in Revelation. Um, we're raised up, and that's why Paul says later, Romans 8, 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that has to be revealed in us. The sufferings that we deal with in life is, is nothing compared to what's coming to heaven. I, I, I firmly believe that when we all get to heaven, most of us will be like, wait, what trouble? We had 
Earth was bad? Was Earth bad? I don't, I've forgotten now. Was, was, was it that bad? Because we won't, it, was just, it would just be amazing to see what we see. And then further down in 828, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's, it's, again, it's one of those memory verses. Highlight it. Meditate on it. The trials of this life, they are for our good because God is working in us. And the Holy Spirit is working to move us into the direction that we need to go. And sometimes it is uncomfortable. And sometimes we do kind of lament those past days when things were easy. I, I do lament every once in a while that I'm no longer a crying baby in church that can just be carried in my mother's arms and I don't have to deal with things. See, I'll see that as like a kid crying in church. I see it as like, I don't know, I'm kind of jealous. I mean, every, that kid doesn't pay bills, just saying, you know. But we grow up, you know, and life does get harder. But when we grow up, we see that God is working towards something greater. And so we grow in those struggles. And we don't fall back to fear. We don't fear the dark. We don't fear the monsters under the bed. Because we know there is no monster under the bed. That, that Christ has defeated the monsters. He's defeated the darkness. There's, so there's no reason to fear. So we move on with our lives. And then the last point in bulletin, the Holy Spirit guides us to God's love, which compels us towards holiness, which is living in the image of God. So this, this is what ties it all together with our series. Right? Our image was corrupted. It was just it was. It was tainted. We have a false view of what it even is most of the time. But God restores it through Christ. He gives us victory. That image can be cleaned up. And it's the Holy Spirit who works in us to reveal what God has designed us to be. And it's, and it's amazing to me how often I've seen uh, in my own life and in other people's lives that where they thought they were going, what they thought was what they really wanted, and God intervenes and says, no, I'm sorry, you can't have that. And then, and, and there, yes, there's a, there's a struggle there, and they're upset, and they're mad. But then they see what God's doing, and it's like, I wouldn't do anything else. It's just, it's, it's fascinating to me to watch. So today, uh, like I said, the, the last two series, the, the last two weeks, this next week and next, are going to look at some very practical ways of how this works out. And we're going to look at what does it mean to be a, a growing and maturing Christian? Um, what does it mean to walk daily in the Holy Spirit? Um, and I highly encourage you to come back for that. But before any of that works, you have to surrender to Christ, and you have to receive the Holy Spirit. So today, as, as, we, as we get to the invitation, Carolyn's going to come lead us, and, and it's just simply this. Are, are, you, are you really saved? Do you really have the Holy Spirit recreating you and pointing you towards holiness and righteousness? Or are you just playing church because that's what you grew up and told to do? Because that's the difference between eternity. So that's what it means to live free. And, then, and so th those other questions you can kind of think about um, and, and reflect on. But, but today, if you've not surrendered to Christ, do that today and begin to understand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who brings victory, who changes our hearts and points us to the truth of Christ and the victory that he established 2,000 years ago. Lord, I pray for us as a, as a church and as individuals that we will be as you've designed us to be and as you want us to be. Encourage us towards righteousness, but Father, also convict us of sin. And if there's anyone here who's just been playing church, who just knows the right words to say at the right time, but is never doesn't actually know you, I pray that today you will, you will cut their hearts and that they will realize that they are a sinner, that they need salvation. And, and no amount of pretending is going to save them, but they need you to be saved. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.